All right, hello, ladies and gentlemen. Let me just get everything set up here. Now I have the captions and everything running, so we are good to go. Hope you guys had a wonderful holiday break. I hope you guys uh, made sure to like, sleep in and rest and take it easy and spend your time, some time with your family. Uh, but we do need to go ahead and continue moving on because we are halfway through world history, and now we need to do the other half of world history. Um, we're still in Unit 5. Now, if you don't remember Unit 5, because it's, it's been a while since you've watched these videos, Unit 5 was all about the political revolutions. We looked at the American Revolution and the French Revolution, and on your day off, which is going to be on Wednesday, you guys have an opportunity to look at the Haitian Revolution and the Latin American Revolutions and the revolutions of 1848. So there's a lot of political revolutions that are going on. We're continuing with this incredibly long unit by looking at a different sort of revolution, and that's going to be the Industrial Revolution. Arguably, the Industrial Revolution did more to revolutionize the world. After all, these political revolutions, yes, changed the way that we thought about governing and they changed borders within uh, some certain societies. The Industrial Revolution really changed everyone's day-to-day -day life. Like the idea of going to work, the fact that you can listen to me on your computer, the fact that you have a cell phone in your hand, all of that is because of the Industrial Revolution. So we're going to look at what caused the Industrial Revolution, and eventually we'll look at what are the positive things of the Industrial Revolution, what are the real negative instincts of the Industrial Revolution? As a reminder, Unit 5 is from the time period 1750 to 1900, so we're getting closer and closer to the modern day. Much of what we're going to be going over in this unit is, you know, are things that should be fairly familiar to us because they still exist within our society today. Let's go ahead and get started with our essential questions. Our first question is, why uh, did the Industrial Revolution begin in Britain, and what were the political, social, and economic, and environmental impacts of this revolution? Whenever we look at reasons in history, or causes, causes is a better word, causes in history, we need to make sure that we're keeping in mind the multiple causes. In our society today, people don't keep that in mind. People try to boil things down to one cause. They say, here's what happened and it caused this and that's the entire story. And it's not that they're wrong, it's just that the story isn't complete. Very rarely in history is there just one cause for something like, you know, people will ask, well, what's the cause of World War I? Well, there's a lot of causes of World War I. There's a lot of causes to the Industrial Revolution and many reasons why it started in, started in Britain. And to boil that down to only one reason is really not a good way to go about studying history. If, if I were to boil it down to one reason for you guys, I would be really doing a disservice as a history teacher. Um, but we'll also be looking at the multiple effects. In just in the same way that there's not just one cause, there's almost never just one effect. We'll see the political effects, such as the rise of democratic capitalism, the rise of new elites, people like John D. Rockefeller, um, who have a whole lot of money and use that money for political power, similar to what Jeff Bezos and Bill Gates do today. Um, we'll see the social impacts. Most people before the Industrial Revolution were living on farms. Now more and more people are moving into the city. We'll also see the changes in social structure. We talked about social structure when we looked at feudalism. We said the kings were on top, the serfs were on bottom, but now we're starting to get rid of kings. It's not really going to be the kings on top and certainly not the serfs on the bottom, but we'll still have a social structure of rich people and poor people on the bottom. So we'll see some changes and continuities, which as we should know is one of our historical thinking skills. And um, th this part here is the economics to it. So as I said, there's going to be the rising of capitalism, but we'll also see the rise in communism. We'll see the division of lab labor. We'll see cheaper goods being produced, which leads to the consumer culture that we have today, where people have money and they buy things instead of trading one good for for another and the environmental impacts. Obviously with the industrial revolution, there's going to be a lot of burning of coal and the talk about envir the environment and climate change is something that you guys should be familiar with because it's something that your teachers have been focusing on since you've been in school. Number two is what, were, what was the role of government in industrialization and how did Western governments differ from non-Western governments? We're going to see that the government plays a key role either by doing a lot or doing nothing at all. In the West, or, or Western style governments, are mostly going to take a hands-off approach where they're not going to do anything. 
non-Western governments are going to be heavily involved. And we're going to see them do a whole lot. We'll look at that uh, at another day in class. And the last one is what were the push and pull factors causing massive migration? There's much immigration that is occurring during this time period. We're going to figure out what's pushing people out of their own, own country and pulling them to different countries, mainly the United States. But the second part is what were the responses to this new influx of immigrants? We're going to see how those nations who are pulling immigrants in, we're going to see how they respond. This is important to us today because we still deal with immigration. In fact, if you look at Brexit, you'll see that one of the major reasons why Brexit occurred is because of a response to the immigration. And when, when we get to that day, we'll talk more about Brexit and I'll uh, tie it into the modern day as well. But all of these are questions that not only apply to this time period, but apply to our time period as well. We should be able to identify the causes of the Industrial Revolution, and we should explain where the Industrial Revolution spread to after it was in Britain. I'll talk more about the proof of understanding when we get to our synchronous learning session. Let's go ahead and get started. So this is the beginning of the first industrial revolution. The first industrial revolution took place in, we're going to say the late 1700s, early 1800s. Um, the second industrial revolution is going to take place at the end of that century. So the end of the 1800s. And we'll get to that a little bit later. Let's focus on the first industrial revolution. And this first industrial revolution is going to see fewer people farming and more people moving into cities. Well, how are people able to move into cities? After all, if you move into a city, it's very difficult to grow food. For example, I'm, I'm where I live, I don't have enough room to grow my own crops. I need access to food. So someone needs to be able to bring the food to the market. And so we need a, someone who is very efficient at growing food. Well, we get these agricultural improvements. Two of them that we need to know are crop rotation and the seed drill. We don't really need to know the science behind it, but we need to know that more food is capable of being grown because of these. The crop rotation was the most interesting one because instead of growing the same crop over and over and over, you just rotate it. As you rotate these crops, the the nitrates and the um, all the things that are good in the soil start to replenish. Um, and as they replenish, it becomes much more efficient to grow food. Think about as you guys, you know, think back, you know, all the way when you uh, used to actually go to school, we would cycle you guys, we would rotate you through classes, you get a little breaks, that way you could replenish yourself. So you could be more efficient when you get to your next class. It's kind of the same idea here with crop rotation, what we need to know, it's going to make food more efficient, which allows people to move into the cities. The second thing is cotton from India to to Britain. This is going to be a major reason why the Industrial Revolution starts in Britain. Remember, we're still operating under this mercantilist idea. If you don't remember mercantilism, mercantilism was this idea that the colonies exist to help the mother country, and they help the mother country in two ways. One, they provide the mother country with resources like cotton. The second thing is that they provide a place for the mother country to sell those goods. So when Britain takes those that takes that cotton and makes textiles like shirts and ties, they can sell it back to the people of India in order to make a whole lot of money. Well, this, it, it continues to be true with cotton coming from India to Britain. Eventually, we get more technology like Richard Arkwright's water frame that makes it easier to create these textiles. And we'll see a little bit later that Britain is going to consume more cotton and produce more textiles than ever before because of this technology. And the third thing is Eli Whitney and the division and specialization of labor. Now, Eli Whitney is actually known um, for the man, he's the man who created the cotton gin, which made it much easier to take the seeds out of cotton in order to you know, actually be able to use the cotton to make textiles, but he also divided and specialized labor. Instead of one person working on the entire project, one person just did one part of that project and then passed it on to the next person who did one part of that project. For example, if I were building a car, instead of me building the entire car, I'm just going to put the wheel on and someone else is going to put the other wheel on and someone else is going to put the steering wheel in and someone else is going to put the engine in and you kind of just send it down the line. That makes it much more efficient to produce those goods and therefore makes more money for a whole lot of people. Let's go ahead and move on to actually my picture right here in order to really demonstrate the uh, efficiency of the 
division of labor. So this is my quarantine table. I acted like every other guy during the quarantine and really got into woodworking. So I made this all, all by myself there. Um, as you can see here, it took me forever to, to do this. I estimate it takes about 48 total hours to cut the wood, sand the wood, paint the wood, stain the wood, and do all of that stuff. That takes forever for me to do all of it. If I now have to do all of it, then if I were to sell this, I have to sell it for a high price. After all, time is money. The longer it takes me to do, the more I have to charge for me to actually make some sort of money that allows me to feed myself and my family and all that. However, if I use the division of labor, and if instead of me doing all the work, I just cut the boards and I gave it to someone else to sand the boards and I gave it to someone else to nail the boards in. I gave it to someone else to um, actually stain or paint it. Well, then it would go much quicker. We can make many more tables. We would speed up production. And since we're taking less time, it would drive down the cost. So now you can start to see why we're going to have a consumer culture. All of those goods that are being traded before this unit, those are really only accessible to people who already had a whole lot of money. Now these goods, because they're made much more efficiently, are going to be accessible to many more people, which is going to be a key part of the Industrial Revolution. Um, the action, the last thing I do want to say here is that this is how people used to do things. Um, when, when we're talking about work, you didn't go to work. You didn't go to a factory. You didn't go somewhere else. You partook in what we call cottage industries, where you just did the work at home. Kind of similar to what we're doing right now, actually. So um, this idea that you, you go to work and you do something at work is really a key part of the Industrial Revolution. We're going to see this transition from cottage industries of you being an artisan, making tables and chairs and textiles in your own house, to you now moving into a factory and being one part of the entire machine and doing one part of the labor. Let's go ahead and move on to our major inventions. With these major inventions, we don't need to really understand how they work. Um, we just need to understand that they made work more efficient. The first one is the flying shovel, which a uh, uh, flying shuttle, which allows for faster weaving. Um, instead of weaving by hand, now you can weave by using the flying shuttle, and now you can create more textiles. The spinning jenny improves on the flying shuttle, so now you can spin more than one thread at the same time. The steam engine even improves upon that. So the steam engine, as is pictured here, instead of being spun by human power, by one person cranking a wheel, now it's steam power in order to, and it, it makes it easier to spin spin cotton or have a train or actually even your car kind of runs on steam engines as well. So all of all of these things make it much more efficient for people to do work and to produce goods. The last one, as I've already talked about, is the cotton gin, which uh, made it much easier for uh, seeds to be picked out of cotton. Eli Whitney actually um, invented this in order to end slavery. He, he said, I'm going to invent the cotton gin. This is going to be great because now there will be no need for slavery, especially in the southern part of what we now call the United States. However, the opposite actually became true because so much more cotton could be picked. I'm sorry, the seeds out of cotton could be picked much more easily. It made it, it, it made it necessary for more cotton to be picked because so many more people were demanding more cotton because of the speed at which uh, the seeds could be picked out of cotton. What I need you to, I understand that's a confusing way to say it, but what I need you to understand is that the cotton gin led to more slavery because there was a higher demand in cotton because of the Industrial Revolution. Let's go ahead and move on to other inventions. These other inventions are really um, going to be coming into play under the second Industrial Revolution, which we'll talk more about in later classes, but the telegraph, the telephone, the light bulb, the airplane, the Model T car, all of those things are going to come about because of the Industrial Revolution, and all of them are going to use the division of labor. All of them are going to use the access to raw materials um, that some of these countries have. All of them are going to be marketed to people, and they're going to be marketed in such a way to, in order to let people know they hate anyone, not just the rich, but anyone should be able to afford these because we make them so efficiently, and so they're much cheaper than ever before. 
Let's get to our big essential question. One of our big essential questions was, why did the Industrial Revolution begin in Britain? Here are all the reasons why it did. The first one is freer political institutions. And here's why I want to take a step back very, very quickly. In Unit 1, we talked about centralized political institutions. We saw the Song Dynasty, per se. Um, and they were highly, highly centralized. And we said that centralization was a good thing. After all, the Islamic world was centralized, the Chinese world was centralized, the Mali Empire was centralized, Europe was decentralized. And we said that Europe was behind everyone else. But going on um, during the Industrial Revolution, the opposite actually occurs, where the more decentralized societies are the ones that are going to move ahead. Why is that? Well, centralized, big centralized societies had big centralized governmental bureaucracy, which takes forever to get through. Many of you are going to be getting your license this year, if you haven't already. In order to get that license, you have to go down to the DMV. And when you are at the DMV, it's going to take hours for you to finally get through, um, finally get to the point where you turn in your paperwork and they get, eventually give you a license. Government bureaucracy tends to be incredibly slow, but by having these freer political institutions, more people can do more things on their own and not have to rely on the government to get things done. And so this free political institution that existed in Britain made it much more likely for individuals to actually do things to improve society instead of waiting around for the government to do things for them. And so there's still this argument that we have today of whether we should have a centralized society and have a big, strong government, or if we should have a decentralized society and let more individuals be the ones who push society forward. That's something that you guys have to decide on your own. I'm not going to tell you how to think. The second one is financial institutions. In order to get things going, you need to have a whole lot of money. The Bank of England it can give money to entrepreneurs. For example, let's use an example here. Um, I see a problem with, back when we, when we were in person. One of the big problems in my afternoon classes is that they were after lunch and students' hands would often be really, really dirty after lunch, specifically from Takis. Students love Takis. They would go and buy Takis and then they stick their hand into the Taki bag and they would take out those stupid Takis and then eat them. But then they got that orange dust or that red dust all over their fingers. So where does that red dust go? Well, it eventually comes into my classroom. It gets over my desk, on my walls, on my carpet everywhere. So let's say I want to invent something to stop that from occurring. I'm going to invent a chopstick type of uh, material or, or, or of a tool. That way you can go into the bag, take out the Taki and eat it without actually having to physically touch it with your fingers and get my room all messy. Well, in order to produce that tool, I'm going to need a whole lot of money. I can go to a bank and get a loan, or I can turn to other investors in my joint stock company here, and I can get other people to give me money so that way I will make a tool that you know people want to have in order um, to eat Takis better. All of that is necessary for me to create this industry. If I don't have that, if I am not able to get a loan, if I, I am not able to get money from shareholders, then I can't do anything, then I can't industrialize. And so that's why these financial institutions are so important. Number, oh, uh, this part right here is the protection of private property. This is an idea of uh, under John Locke as well. Remember, he said life, liberty, and property. I want you to think about it this way because this one often gets overlooked. Property is incredibly important because you take care of your private property better than a communal property. For example, in school, the sack or the lunchroom is always dirty. Why? Because it doesn't belong to anyone. It's a communal property. So since there's a, a mess in the, in, if there's a mess in the sack or the mess in the lunchroom, you don't feel the need to actually clean it and take care of it and pick it up and do whatever it is you have to do because it's communal. It doesn't belong to you. But if you come to my classroom, my classroom is really clean. Why? My classroom is my private property. I'm going to clean up my private property because my private property belongs to me. And I want to make sure that my private property is maintained properly because hopefully I can use my private property in order to make myself a whole lot of money. That's what many farmers in Britain did as well. They started having more private farms instead of communal farms because if they're taking care of their private farms, they can use those 
uh, private plots of land much more efficiently than a communal land where no one really cares about if it's up kept or uh, kept up or not. So let's go ahead and move on to our resource advantage. Number three is the resource advantage. This is a big part of human beings interacting with their environment. Britain has a whole lot of coal. Coal can be burned in order to produce steam and or produce energy and that's how we get the steam engine the coal burns and the steam engine runs so you need to have a whole lot of coal in order to have an industrialized society and that's what britain had they also had rivers to transport the goods were very very cheap and they also had the resources from their colonies like the united states until the american revolution um india and then egypt in addition to this, not only do they get resources, but as I said earlier, they also have markets. And that's going to be a big part of our next unit, unit six, when we talk about imperialism. The last part is the population growth. As we're going to see a bit later, the population growth is going, and population is going to go way up. Um, during this time period. There's gonna be a massive spike worldwide because of the Industrial Revolution. Why is this? There's much more efficient food growth via crop rotation, um, but also more people are able to work in the city. So more people come to the cities, they're able to work, they're able to receive money, and they can use that money to buy food. So more people have more access to more food and so more people are going to survive let's go ahead and talk about some data very quickly and then we'll both we'll go ahead and finish up if you look at this here and this is what i was referring to earlier is that from 1760 to 1769 so before the industrial revolution great britain is uh, consuming about 3.5 million pounds of cotton so they're getting cotton from india and at uh, this time from the united states and they're only exporting about 227 pounds really not that much. Contrast this to 1820 to 1829. Remember, this isn't that much later. This is 60 years later. So feasibly, someone could have been alive for both of these. That's how short of a time period this is. They've now increased to 166 and a half million pounds and then have also exported 25,000. That's almost, uh, what, 10 times as much there. So what we're seeing is that more and more resources are being consumed and more and more exports are being sent out, thus producing see more money for arguably for everyone. We'll talk about where that money is going in uh, subsequent lectures because we'll see the rise of new elites and we'll still see that there are poor people in the lower classes. But I want you to see how impactful the industrial revolution is and how much more resources are being consumed. Let's go ahead and move on to the spread of industrialization. It's going to really start up here in Britain, as I said, and will eventually spread. So the further you are away from Britain, the later you're going to become industrialized. General rule from there. The only exception is one we'll talk about in just a second here. France is going to have a huge population, but their urban centers aren't as big. In addition to that, you had the French Revolution in the 1790s, so that kind of messed everything up as well. And so they're going to be a little later. Um, Germany was not unified. And, and actually, what you're going to see on Wednesday is that Germany becomes unified in 1871. And once they become unified, then they catch up. Then they become highly industrialized um, as they are now today. Um, and then Russia is actually going to be one of the last places to industrialize. And we'll talk about that more when we look at the backwardness of Russia a little bit later. The big exception to all of them is the United States of America. The United States of America, obviously very far from Britain, but they're going to industrialize around the same time. And we're going to see that this is what causes the United States to eventually become a world power, especially um, during the World War I, World War II eras. The United States is going to catch up to everyone else during the Industrial Revolution and will eventually dominate. And we'll talk about that more in Unit 7. But this all begins with Samuel Slater. He's a British manufacturer. Now, Samuel Slater, um, as, as I said, he's a British manufacturer. The British do not want this technology to get out. They know that this technology, this industrialized society, the spinning jenny, the cotton, all that stuff, they know that that stuff's good. And if they, it gets out to other countries, other countries are going to catch up. So Britain tries to lock down their borders. They say, you, you can't take this technology out. You cannot leave with it. You cannot go somewhere else with it. Because if you go somewhere else with it, that's going to mess up this whole thing that we got going on here. Well, Samuel Slater knows that if he can bring this technology to the United States, 
he can make a whole lot of money because the United States has a lot of resources. And plus, no one else in the United States has done this yet. So he would be the first person to do it. And therefore, he would make a whole lot of money. This is an example of an individual uh, pushing society forward, as we talked about a little bit earlier. So what he does is he memorizes everything. He looks at a, co uh, he looks at a textile factory. He memorizes all the technology, how to build it. He memorizes how the factory is actually built. And so when he shows up at the border, ready to leave and go to the United States, he doesn't have any technology on him. There's no technology. There's no blueprints. All of it's up here. Um, and obviously, the guards can't see that. So they let him board a ship. Samuel Slater comes down over to Pawtucket, Rhode Island, and from memory, reconstructs everything that he saw in Britain, thus creating the first cotton mill in the United States and thus kicking off the Industrial Revolution for the United States. The United States and, and Britain, as I have here, will dominate the Industrial Revolution, both the first Industrial Revolution, and then we'll see the United States will really dominate the second Industrial Revolution in the late 1800s. Overall, these are the effects of the Industrial Revolution. All of these things, which is why the Industrial Revolution is more revolutionary than the political revolutions that we've already gone over. I'm not going to talk about all of these things right now because I'll talk about them more in subsequent lectures. Um, ladies and gentlemen, that's gonna go ahead and wrap up our lecture on the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. In our next lecture, we're going to look at the economic innovations of the Industrial Revolution. So we'll be talking more about the rise of capitalism and laissez-faire economics under Adam Smith. Make sure you guys have uh, kept good notes and make sure you also finish the video worksheet for this uh, lecture video as well.